गुड मॉर्निंग क्लास टुडे आई विल टेक योर क्लास ऑन एंटेरिक फीवर सो टाइफॉइड फीवर और एंट्रिक फीवर इज एन एक्यूट जनरलाइज इन्फेक्शन ऑफ द इंटेस्टाइनल लिम्फॉइड टिश्यू गोल ब्लैडर एंड रेटिकुलर एंडोथीलियल सिस्टम एंड इट इज कॉल्ड बाय कॉस्ड बाय थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ सैलमनला सैलमनला टाइफी सैलमनला पैराटाइफी ए एंड रेयरली बाय सैलमनला पैराटाइफी बी so salmonella is a gram negative bacterium and the ratio of disease caused by s typhi to that caused by s para typhi is approximately 10 is to 1 so s typhi is a gram negative motile and flagellated bacteria bacteria it is a facultative anaerobe and it has three major antigens first is the h or the flagellar flagellar antigen which is heat labile and it appears on day 10 to 12 after the onset of disease o is the somatic antigen it is present on the cell wall so it is a part of the liposaccharide of the cell wall and it is heat stable appears on 6 to 8th day after the onset of illness both these antigens h and o they they are useful in zero diagnosis like for example in vidal test the third antigen is vi antigen which is a surface polysaccharide it is heat stable and vi stands for virulent so it is virulent in nature and this is used for preparation of vaccine because the antibodies against the vi antigen are protective in nature so this is the structure of s typhi it consists of an outer cell membrane cell wall the inner cell membrane these are the plasmids so plasmids are the extra chromosomal dna so this replicates independent of the chromosomal dna and this is responsible for the uh, for the resistance which is acquired by the foreign genes so this is this can undergo this, this is a cause of re resistance in the s typhi so coming to the epidemiology humans are the only reservoir of s typhi peak incidence is in 5 to 15 years of age and typhoid is essentially a food and water borne disease so contaminated water milk and milk products vegetables grown in sewage irrigated farms meat products and shellfish which are uh, grown in sewage contaminated water are common sources house flies are known for spreading infection via food and this s typhi can survive for a long period in the environment for around 7 days in water up to 30 days in ice and ice creams 60 days in sewage irrigated soil and 20 days on the external surface of the house fly this is a map showing the distribution of typhoid fever around the globe so you can see that india is an endemic country there is a high incidence of typhoid fever in india coming to the pathogenesis the infected infecting dose of about 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 9 organisms are usually required to cause infection the incubation period is about 4 to 14 days depending upon the inoculating dose so if the inoculating dose is less then in the incubation period is usually longer so after ingestion first of all the s typhi has to survive the gastric acidic ph most are killed and if they survive there they invade the body through the gut mucosa in the terminal ileum so in the terminal ileum they adhere to the m cells of the intestinal epithelium which overlay the pears patches so once it adheres to the epithelium it invades the epithelium it multiplies in the submucosa and then it drains to the mesenteric lymph nodes so here in mesenteric lymph nodes multiplication occurs and then the organism passes from there into the blood stream via the lymphatics so you can see in this diagram so these are the m cells the salmonella typhi attached to the m cells and then it invades the epithelium and it goes to the submucosa and from there it reaches the lymph mesenteric lymph nodes so when it reaches the mesenteric lymph nodes it multiplies there and 
it finally through the lymphatics enters the blood stream okay so the first time it enters the blood stream it is called as primary bacteremia and this primary bacteremia does not give rise to symptoms okay so you must remember that primary bacteremia does not give rise to symptoms so once the organisms come in the, in the blood stream they are disseminated all over the body especially to the reticular endothelial system liver spleen bone marrow and here again multiplication takes place inside the macrophages so after multiplication inside the macrophages the bacteria are again released into the blood stream causing secondary bacteremia this secondary bacteremia is uh, causes the symptoms so from here the symptoms herald so here the incubation period ends and there is occurrence of symptoms so from when it comes to the blood stream again it disseminates widely in the body and it again reaches the pear patches where it causes ulceration etc so infection with s typhi produces an inflammatory response in the deeper mucosal layers and underlying lymphoid tissue so there is hyperplasia of the pear patches sometimes there is necrosis and sloughing of the epithelium causing ulcerations coming to the clinical features first of all there is an incubation period of around 7 to 14 days it can vary from 3 to 32 days as i told you depending upon the infecting range after that the symptoms can be a mild with low grade fever malaise and a dry cough or very it can range from mild illness to a severe clinical picture with high grade fever abdominal discomfort and multiple complications in older children and adolescents usually the onset is insidious there is gradual rise in fever in a step ladder manner as you know enteric fever is a typical example of step ladder fever so there is a gradual rise of fever means there is daily increment of about 1 to 2 degree fahrenheit up to 5 to 7 days after which the fever becomes constant the temperature becomes constant from 100 to 207 degree fahrenheit and if the treatment is not initiated at this point the temperature remains unremitting at this level for about 10 to 14 days and after that during convalescence the fever starts falling down diminishes and it falls down also in a stepwise pattern over several days relative bradycardia is manifested in older children and adults means what is relative bradycardia means as expected there uh, for every 1 degree rise of temperature there is increase in the pulse rate by 10 beats per minute but if the pulse rate does not increase this much and increases less as compared to this then it is called as relative bradycardia associated features are generalized myalgia abdominal pain hepatosplenomegaly and anorexia diarrhea or constipation may also occur usually diarrhea occurs in younger children and constipation occurs in older children now in about 25% of the cases you also get a macular or a maculopapular rash called as the rose spots they are visible around 7th to 10th day of the illness and they appear in crops of 10 to 15 on the lower chest and the periumbilical region so lower chest and abdominal region and they last for 2 to 3 days now presentation is more severe and dramatic in children less than 5 years there is higher rate of complications higher rates of hospitalization and even case fatality rates are higher in this age group so these are the common clinical features of typhoid fever as i already told you now if there are no complications the symptoms and physical findings gradually resolve within 2 to 4 weeks complications can occur in 10 to 15% of the patients and are usually seen in the second and third week of infection relapse rates are 5 to 20% and relapse occurs 2 to 3 weeks after the fever subsides or after stopping antibiotics so 2 to 3 weeks after stopping antibiotics or after subsidence of fever and this relapse is usually similar in nature but it is milder and of a shorter duration so what can be the complications in a case of enteric fever the most frequent are the gi complications the out of which the most common again is paralytic ileus and abdominal distension then more severe gi complications are intestinal hemorrhage and perforation so if if there is intestinal perforation the symptoms will be preceded by a marked increase in abdominal pain distenderness vomiting and 
sudden tachycardia, hypotension, guarding and rigidity. Okay, there will be leukocytosis and you can diagnose it on x-ray abdomen where you can see free air in the drain. There can be certain systemic rare complications like toxic myocarditis, neurological complications. Neurological complications are usually rare in children. Even GI hemorrhage is also rare in children. And there can be several other complications like pyelonephritis, osteomyelitis, separative arthritis, meningitis, etc. Hepatitis, yes, etc. Overall mortality is less than 1% if you see throughout the world but it is higher in infants and in India it is higher. So the gold standard for diagnosis is culture. Culture, either blood culture or from bone marrow, stool, urine, even culture of rose pots and duodenal aspirates are also helpful. So blood culture is the gold standard diagnostic test and it is positive in 40 to 60 percent of the cases seen early in the course of the disease. So blood culture has most utility if it is done in the first week of illness. Highest yield is in the first week. It's about 90% and then it goes on decreasing. Bone marrow culture is even better. It has a sensitivity between 80 to 95% but it is invasive. So it is mostly reserved for cases of pyrexia of unknown origin. The advantages are that, that because salmonella is an intracellular organism, the concentration of bacteria in bone marrow is much higher than that of the peripheral blood. And even in patients who have received antibiotics, organisms can be detected there. Stool culture is positive in 30% of the cases and becomes positive after the first week. Then other supportive investigations are CBC, complete blood count, in which you usually get leukopenia characteristically, but in young children, you can also get a leukocytosis. Lego function test may be mildly deranged. There's slight increase in SGOT, SGPT and prothrombin time, but it is usually not more than two to three times of baseline levels. So serological tests, which are the most frequently done tests for diagnosis, the most common among them is Vidal. So, however, it is the most commonly done test, but it has moderate, only moderate sensitivity and specificity, and it has a lot of limitations. So, it measures antibodies against the ONH antigens of S type. But these ONH antigens are also present in a lot number of enterobacteria. So, it is there are high chances of false positive results. A high titer in the first sample collected at the end of the first week is highly suggestive. A rising titer in a paired sample is even more diagnostic but it is not clinically useful because you have to take a gap of two weeks between the two samples till then your illness you cannot wait for the diagnosis. Okay, So there are certain limitations of Vidal like even in 30% of blood culture positive cases Vidal has been found to be negative. And in endemic countries like India, there's a, there is a baseline antibody level. So you have to evaluate the results according to that. An antimicrobial treatment can also alter the response and there can be false positive tests in a lot of conditions like malaria, typhus, sepsis with other organisms, cirrhosis, etc. And there is cross-reactivity with other enterobacteria also as I told you. Then there are other tests like Typhidot, which is a good test, IgM strip test, Antigen detection tests in PCR are newer tests. So in PCR, usually the am specific genes are amplified. So even if the bacteremia is low, level of bacteremia is low, it is better detected by this method. Now coming to the management part. An early diagnosis of typhoid fever and institution of appropriate treatment are very essential. And majority of the children can be managed at home with oral antibiotics and close medical follow-up for complications or failure of response to therapy. Now, which patients you have to admit? Those patients who have persistent vomiting, they are unable to, uh, unable to take orally, severe diarrhea and abdominal distension, they require hospitalization. So first of all, the general principles of management are adequate rest, maintaining hydration of the patient, giving appropriate fluids and antipyretic therapy. So, paracetamol is used in a dose of 10 to 15 mg per kg every 4 to 6 hourly as required. The diet should be 
soft and easily digestible but there is no need to restrict the diet in any sense and the major treatment is antibiotic therapy which is critical to minimize the complications. So the problem with enteric fever is that there is an emergence of antibiotic resistance so the antibiotic treatment is influenced by the prevalence of resistance. Since 1990s Salmonella typhi has developed resistance simultaneously to all the drugs which were used as first-line treatment. So, it was called as MDR typhoid fever. What is MDR typhoid fever? A typhoid fever caused by S typhi which is resistant to all the first, all the three first-line drugs which are chloramphenicol, cotrimoxazole and ampicillin. If after that, when there was resistance to all these three first line drugs, came the fluoroquinolones. But in India, again, there has been reports, lot of reports regarding resistance to fluoroquinolones also. So after fluoroquinolone resistance, third generation, third generation cephalosporins were used in the treatment. However, there are still sporadic reports of resistance to them, but they are the most commonly used antibiotics even first in antibiotics used nowadays. Apart from that, azithromycin can be used as an alternative agent for treatment of uncomplicated typhoid fever. So it is used orally. And then there are IV drugs like astronam and imipenem which are reserved and their potential third line drugs have to be used recently in cases of resistance to cephalosporins. So this is a treatment protocol of enteric fever. In case of uncomplicated enteric fever, which does not require hospitalization, we usually give third generation cephalosporins like cefixime and cefpodoxime in a dose of 50 to 15 to 20 mg per kg per day for 14 days. In case of MDR, the second line drug is azithromycin, and in case of fully sensitive bacteria, the first any of the first line drugs can be given. In case of severe enteric fever requiring hospitalization, in a fully sensitive patient, treatment is started with any of the injectable third-line cephalosporins like ceftriaxone, cefotaxime or cefoperazone. So these three are used, ceftriaxone, cefotaxime and cefoperazone. And alternatively, as second line, if the organism is sensitive, you can use any of the first-line drugs. In a case of MDR, the second-line drug will be astronam. So, the messages you have to take and learn by for the, for the treatment is that most of the typhoid cases can be managed at home with oral antibiotics and good nursing care. And for severe cases with vomiting, inability to take oral feeds, severe diarrhea, abdominal distension, parenteral antibiotics in a hospital setting will be required. The nalidixic acid resistant S typhi is a marker of reduced susceptibility to fluoroquinolone. In that case, it's in, in that case we use third generation cephalosporins. So, okay. So I I want to tell you one thing about this that even in cases of fluoroquinolone sensitive patients in India in children less than eighteen years of age, Drug Controller General of India does not recommend the use of fluoroquinolones unless the child is resistant to all other antibiotics and is suffering from life-threatening infection. So in India, in children less than 18 years, even in cases of fluoroquinolone sensitive strains, we use third generation cephalosporins as the first line drugs nowadays. Okay, so you should remember that. So third generation cephalosporins, both oral and injectables are recommended for first line treatment. Azithromycin can be used as an alternative agent in treatment of uncomplicated typhoid fever. Astronam and imipenem are potential second line drugs. And for life threatening infection, resistant to all other recommended antibiotics, fluoroquinolones may be used. Okay. So this shows the global distribution of MDR strains of S typhi around the globe in which you can see that in India there has been uh, India has in India there has been reported reporting of nalidixic acid resistant strains. So how do you prevent enteric fever? So contamination of water supplies with sewage is the most important factor responsible for the outbreak. So good 
hygienic domestic water supply is most important thing which it, which can be which has to be done central chlorination as well as domestic water purification is important then the use of vaccines so who recommends any one of the three typhoid vaccines out of these the first and the most important one is the injectable typhoid conjugate vaccine which consists of vi polysaccharide antigen linked to tetanus toxoid protein so since this is a polysaccharide antigen when it is linked to a protein it increases the immunogenicity it can be used in younger children from 6 months onwards and it has a longer duration of protection so this is the preferred vaccine in all ages the second vaccine is a vi polysaccharide vaccine which contains only the vi polysaccharide antigen so it's an injectable vaccine and can be used for persons aged 2 years and above only the third one is an oral live attenuated ty21a vaccine it is available in the form of capsules and can be used in in uh, in people more than 6 years of age so this is not uh, recommended in india it is recommend uh, used being used in countries like usa now shortly we'll discuss something about non typhoidal salmonellosis so as i told you the salmonella can be typhoidal and non typhoidal the typhoidal salmonella are s typhi and s para typhi while there can be several non typhoidal serovars also which are thousands in number and they cause a gastroenteritis of rapid onset and brief duration in contrast to typhoid fever which has a considerably longer incubation period and duration of illness so the nts is of rapid onset means short incubation period and lasts for a few days 2 to 7 days while enteric fever was had a longer incubation period and the duration was of illness was also longer okay in enteric fever there is predominance of systemic symptoms whereas in nts there are basically gastrointestinal symptoms of enteritis or diarrhea so why is this difference because what happens is the nta serovars serovars they are unable to overcome the defense mechanisms the local dis defense mechanisms in the intestine that limit the bacterial dissemination so there are certain defense mechanisms in the body that limit the bacterial dissemination from the intestine to the systemic circulation so nts is not able to overcome these mechanisms in immunocompetent individuals okay whereas in typhoidal strains they possess unique virulent traits that allow them to overcome the mucosal barrier functions in immunocompetent host and then they cause a severe systemic illness they are two most important serovars responsible for this is salmonella enteritis and salmonella typhi murium they are the two most important serotypes for salmonellosis transmitted for from animals to humans so they are caused they they have a the nts serovars have a broad host range they infect a variety of animals and human beings whereas in typhoid humans were the only host okay so animal feeds contaminated with salmonella are an important source of infection for animals and salmonella infections in chicken increase the risk of contamination of eggs and they are important source of outbreaks so meat poultry eggs are an important source of outbreaks in human beings so in pathogenesis the typical intestinal mucosal response to nts infection is an enterocolitis where there is diffuse mucosal inflammation and edema sometimes with erosions and micro abscesses the underlying lymphoid tissue in mesenteric lymph nodes enlarge and may demonstrate small areas of necrosis so in the clinical manifestations the most important is the acute enteritis in which there is a short incubation period of 6 to 72 hours mean is 24 hours and after this there is an abrupt onset of nausea vomiting so first there is nausea vomiting and abdominal pain followed by mild to severe watery diarrhea and sometimes there can be blood and mucus in the loose stools also children may have fever also and the symptoms usually subside in 2 to 7 days now another manifestation may be bacteremia 
so in which there is systemic symptoms. The transient bacteremia can occur in 1 to 5 percent of children with salmonella diarrhea, and bacteremia is positive with any salmonella serotype, but especially it occurs in individuals with reduced host defense, so with immunodeficiencies, and who have altered reticuloendothelial or cellular immune function. So systemic symptoms can be fever, pneumonia, diarrhea, there will be hepatospinum galli. And the diagnosis is made by culture of the organisms from feces or other body fluids. So treatment first, uh, most important is because the child is having severe watery diarrhea. So you have to correct dehydration and electrolyte disturbances by giving judicious fluids and supportive care. This is the key to the management. Antibiotics are generally not recommended for treatment of isolated, uncomplicated salmonella gastroenteritis. Because if you give antibiotics in these patients, it may disrupt the normal intestinal flora and they prolong the excretion of salmonella. So there is increased chances of development of a chronic carrier state. However, in young infants, or less than three months and in immunocompromised patients they must receive an appropriate antibiotic unless the results of culture are known so this is the empirical treatment which has to be started in infants less than three months and in immunocompromised persons so the antibiotics which are used are cefotaxime or ceftriaxone or ampicillin or oral cefixine Okay, so this was the end of the lecture. Thank you.